This reporter had the privilege of interviewing Justice O'Connor twice when she was serving on the Supreme Court uh, back in the first decade of this century. And um, I will have to say that she was, she was not the easiest interview. Um, she was uncomfortable with the press, and uh, she was doing it principally to promote either one of her books or a cause that she believed in. Uh, and she was really not ready to take sort of hard-hitting questions. And in fact, uh, on one of those occasions in those interviews, which took place in the great conference room at the Supreme Court, uh, Justice O'Connor almost ripped off her microphone and walked off the interview after I asked her about some of the abortion decisions. Uh, but uh, she was gracious to stay, and, um, and, and certainly hers is an extraordinary American story. Uh, not only the first woman on the Supreme Court, but she'd also had been uh, the state Senate majority leader in the state of Arizona. Uh, and she graduated from Stanford Law School back in the 1950s uh, at a time when it was really difficult for women to uh, forge ahead in the legal profession. Uh, and she would, even though she was at the top of her class or close to it, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor would receive job offers for a secretary and that sort of thing. Uh, but um, one of her uh, colleagues, one of her classmates at Stanford Law in the early 1950s, and someone she dated, was her future colleague on the Supreme Court, Chief Justice William Rehnquist. And in one of those interviews, uh, I asked Justice O'Connor about this, and I said, now it's well known that you dated your, your future colleague, Chief Justice Rehnquist, while the two of you were at Stanford. Yes, we went to a few movies together, she said. And I said, now on those occasions, <laughs> did... Uh, Mr. Rehnquist behave uh, uh, with judicial restraint, or was he more of an activist? <laughs> and she said, oh, heavens, he was a perfect gentleman. And the person who laughed loudest at that wisecrack, by the way, was uh, Justice O'Connor's late husband, who was seated on the periphery of the, uh, of the interview um, and could be heard chortling out loud. Uh, so uh, as, in terms of uh, Justice O'Connor's jurisprudential legacy, it is towering. Uh, she not only wrote many important opinions, but she served as the decisive fifth swing vote uh, in many cases. Uh, and one, of course, of the most uh, famous or infamous, depending on one's uh, political point of view, uh, is the decision in 1992 in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which reaffirmed and upheld Roe v. Wade, uh, something for which uh, some of her conservative colleagues never really forgave Justice O'Connor. Uh, Justice O'Connor, of course, was appointed by President Reagan, one of the leading conservatives ever to serve as president. Uh, but once she got on the Supreme Court, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, as a justice, uh, often in providing that swing vote, sided with the so-called liberal bloc of justices. She was not considered a reliably conservative vote. Uh, she did not favor the method of statutory and constitutional interpretation that her colleague Justice Antonin Scalia had presented of originalism. Rather than looking to the original text of the Constitution or a given statute, uh, Justice O'Connor would look to the outcomes of the rulings, uh, and she would employ complicated three-pronged tests that Scalia abhorred. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, because of that role as the swing justice on the Supreme Court, uh, Justice O'Connor was not just an influential justice, but one of the most influential Americans of her time.